Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to Cloud Wars Live, where we are exploring the digital revolution that's taking place in our very, very different world here as our personal lives, our work lives, where we live, what we do, how we think, and how we think about the future are all profoundly different than they were just a few months ago. Uh, there are some leadership challenges springing up. Uh, where do companies go? What do CEOs do? How do they try to restore some sense of normalcy, predictability, focus and direction in these very changing times. And we're delighted to have one of our regular monthly guests, one of our digital art all-stars, Charles Araujo, who's with us today to talk about some of those things. Charlie, thanks for coming back to Cloud Wars Live. Always a pleasure, Bob. I love these, these conversations. Well, good deal, sir. And just to remind folks, if they haven't seen Charles before, he is an author. Uh, Charles is a regular uh, commentator. He's got your digital future site with some fascinating content on that. He's been a, a consultant and an analyst really understands not only the tech, deep technology side of things, but how those play into what businesses are trying to do, how leaders and CEOs can take advantage of these technologies to do new things. And Charlie, it looked like from some of the notes you sent over that, you know, top of mind for you today is how do some of those things that we took so much for granted in the very recent past, um, they're sort of been put in a blender and stirred up and you know, what's coming out these days and how do we get back to some sense of predictability and normalcy and things like you mentioned strategic planning and some other things like that. Well, you know, it's interesting because sometimes thing, you know, the roads lead to road is my, my favorite Robert Frost poem goes, but I think what happened is I, I spent a lot of time, in fact, the last time I was on the show with you, we were talking about resiliency and continuity. And I, I mean, I ended up hitting that topic on a bunch of different fronts on a bunch of different angles. And what was interesting is part of that, that conversation, um, a number of those sort of branches kept leading me back to this idea of revisiting the nature of strategic planning. And a lot of it was in the context of this pandemic and how, as we were just talking about off camera, you know, nobody could have predicted. If anyone thought they could tell the future, the last few months have proven that complete, you know, mockery because it's just, we can't really do a good job of this. But if you think about the strategic planning processes that most enterprises go through, that's exactly what it is. It's this exercise of thinking that we can somehow project the future in five, 10 year, 20 year, you know, increments out. I remember one executive I was talking to years ago said, we do hundred year strategic planning. And it was like, okay. And, and so, you know, in light of all of this, disruption. In fact, I'm giving a speech in September all about this era of continuous disruption, as I'm starting to call it. It, it. it was just funny how all of these sort of brought me back to this idea that we need to take a fresh look at how we approach strategic planning within the enterprise as one of these kind of core tenants. Well, I, Charles, it's interesting you brought up, you know, our last episode, because I remember that some of this talk about business continuity. And one thing even before the pandemic that we got to was um, not a lot of things in our world, even before March were all that continuous. And you had described, I think very eloquently last time about how this new sense of what continuity means, what resiliency means, they've got very, very different connotations here. So you're, you've got two things that seem to be in, uh, in counterpoint to each other here with continuous disruption disruption how do you do strategic planning and what is the nature of strategic planning how far out can somebody think and or is it just hey you know let's try to get by as best we can quarter to quarter how do companies try to find a, a medium or an end state that is achievable and, and that's relevant these days yeah you know look i think strategic planning has always been an exercise in directional planning i mean even you know even when we were doing five-year or 10-year strategic plans, it really wasn't about, hey, this is what it was going to be 10 years from now. I mean, for a long time, the world has been moving faster than that. But I think what is dynamic or what is fascinating now is just how dynamic it is of how quickly it's changing. And so, you know, I pointed you to a couple of things that I was um, coming back to. One was, was is actually not new. It's um, some work on strategic planning by Roger Martin and A.G. Lafley from their book, Playing to Win. But what was interesting about it is, is that lately some folks that spend a lot more time focused on this than I do are connecting that with a more, more recent evolution, and that is this idea of the OKRs, of, of objectives and key results approach. 
and and they're kind of putting these two things together, right? So using the um, the approach of you know what market are we in? You know what's going to make us different? These some five questions that was the Roger Martin kind of model, and then using that to feed into this idea of establishing objectives and key results as a way to sort of simplify this process. And what I really took from it is is it allows you to be much more agile. You're not locked into this thing because it's a little bit simpler. And I think that's really what this comes down to is because we still need the process of trying to figure out where the different paths are leading, not because we're going to be right about the future, but because it gives us this directional sense of what to prepare for. And, you know, I remember when I first started uh, being on, like uh, being a keynoter and giving talks, people started calling me a futurist. And I, I joked about it from stage. I used to carry, I think I've talked about this before, I carry on a crystal ball. But one of the things I realized was that being a futurist wasn't about knowing the future. It was about being in this constant state of exploration about the future. And that's what I think this is. This is uh, the new strategic planning is less for, less, much less about these definitives and much more about how do we explore where all this can go and give ourselves some tools to react quickly. And Charlie, forgive me if I've said this before as you've, you've talked some about the future, but uh, great novelist, William Gibson, a, a neuromancer, but he was fond of saying the future's already here, it's just unevenly distributed. And, you know, we, I, I, I think that, you know, it's one of those things we can get an idea of, but Charlie, just along those lines too, the directional stuff that you mentioned, because I, I think what you're saying makes a great deal of sense there, but there's also been, and I think this was percolating up over the last couple of years, last few years, but certainly has been intensified over the last few months, is a sense of corporate leaderships about purpose. And how do you weave that one additional strand into you know, some, some pretty big thinking you're doing there? How should leaders think about that today? Yeah, well, so I think it's it's interesting. So there was an article in Fast Company not too long ago that purpose might be the new superpower. And it was talking very specifically in the context of both being socially purpose-driven um, with all the unrest that we've had, um, and also from the standpoint of how you interact with customers. And the basic message of the story was we, we've sort of separated the wheat from the chaff during this period that those companies that were just sort of giving lip service to being socially conscious or having purpose – are not being able to sustain it because it's becoming extremely real right now. But what I think is interesting from a strategic planning perspective is that I, I think it's broader than just that. I think it impacts um, our, the way we engage with our employees as well, right? Especially younger generations. But frankly, I think that's sort of a, um, of a misnomer. I think all of us want to work with and for organizations that are engaged and share an attitude or share a sense of um, you know, just kind of directionally, again, what we believe in. And so I think that this idea of purpose is not only our customers demanding it, but I think our employees are demanding it. And it's an important component that ties it together. And it needs to be, I think part of the point of this article in Fast Company was, if it's not part of your sort of your strategic posture of your cultural, um, you know, your cultural essence, then it's not gonna be sustainable. And so, you know, I've, I've been, we've, we also, um, the Institute for Digital Transformation has launched a podcast called the Digital Experience Revolution and kind of talking about our research there. And we were talking about this, this topic as well, saying, you know, organizations, it used to be that we sort of wanted to create some space, right, where it's like, we didn't want to get engaged politically or around these controversial subjects, kind of stick to the knitting of your business. But what's interesting is the dynamic has shifted that both your employees and customers now are listening and they're expecting you to, right? Because the, this empathy that, they're ex that, that we need to create the level of engagement that I think is at the center of value creation going forward requires much more than I'm just delivering a transactional product for a transactional fee, right? It's, it is now this much more deeply ingrained thing. And so suddenly purpose becomes a strategic enabler and, and a strategic imperative. And so it's, it's just sort of this interesting dynamic that all these things are, that have been swirling around are kind of coming together. They, they are, Charlie, absolutely. And you know, as you were describing that, I thought that uh, one of the leaders today that I think does the best job of this is Mark Benioff at Salesforce, right? For the 20 years the company's been around, 1% of your time, 1% of your, you know, the contributions and so on, and that adds up. And it's, it's a beautiful story. And I think your point, which is right on the mark, which is saying you can't just sort of glom this on over on the side and say, oh yeah, that cultural purpose thing. Yeah, let's spend five minutes talking about that. 
it either is a part of you or it isn't. And you, you can't fake that. But at the same time, in a few earnings calls or some of his uh, public commentary recently, it's sort of jarring as Mark's going through the financial results of the company, expecting to sort of come out, bam, you know, this much revenue, this much profit, this much growth rate. Here's how we're doing and, you know, around the world. And then he says, it's sort of like our philanthropic thing, 1%, 1%. We've raised, you know, this much money and done this many projects. So I can see that, it, that you know, what he's trying to do. This is a part of who we are as much as the financial side. And as he's talk about not just shareholders, but stakeholders. But there is something jarring when you talk about this purpose-driven stuff in the language of financial metrics. So I would, I would not be surprised at all if Mark Benioff, who's pretty good about messaging and language and uh, communication, if he refines that. So there's got to be a way that companies embrace it, talk about it openly and clearly, but put it in a context that connects it to what you're doing, but also gives it that richly deserved separate status. Yeah, I think one of the hard things, and I think this is particularly difficult for, you know, like IT leaders because there there can be so much abstraction involved, but connecting those dots between the organizational performance across all those traditional dimensions and this idea of purpose is actually really difficult, right? It can be very difficult for Benioff or anybody, and, and you know, as you said, he's one of the best, to be able to make that connection between here are these things we are doing um, on the purpose side, quote unquote, and they are directly impacting these things that you as financial shareholders maybe care about. But I don't think there's any question about it. It's just very difficult to demonstrate because that isn't, you know, that isn't exactly how we all function. But you and I, we all make these decisions and increasingly it's becoming very relevant. And sometimes in the very garish political sense, like we've seen recently, but more often in just the everyday sort of thing, you end up getting this feeling about an organization because as it permeates through everything. And, and what I think is interesting is that it starts feeding into like the social signals, right? How people interact on social media and all those, that it all just weaves together. And I think it, it so it makes it very hard if you're a hardcore numbers person or if you're highly technical where you're used to seeing A equals B, that that can be a, a difficult a difficult step to make. But and I'll give you just a, a little sidebar example. My son, who works for a tech company, which I think is hilarious because growing up, he swore he hated tech, right? But he now works for a tech company. And of course, in the midst of all this, he was expressing um, like some consternation about the work. And it had nothing to do with the work. But what he realized is that so much what he loved about his organization was the camaraderie, the being in an office together, just the shared experiences. It was the culture that has sort of been right now abstracted away. I think not to change subjects here, but in the work from home thing, I think this is something that organizations have to really be focused on is not losing those cultural dimensions that bring so much draw to, to their employees. But, but as that got abstracted, he sort of saw that where that difference was. And so this idea of being purpose-driven is a huge part of their culture, which drives a huge part of the feelings that people, both employees and your customers have. And there is a direct correlation, even if it's hard to quantify, to all these financial metrics you're talking about. So this is, I think this is going to continue to evolve over time, but it's something that we can't just dismiss because we can't make that easy connection. Yeah. And, and Charlie, along with what you're saying too, if this new world plays out as it looks like it's going to play out here, um, a quarter of the people, a third of the people, 40%, half are going to say, I'm not going to go back to working at that campus or that high rise or, you know, with the commute that's involved. I'm going to work here. And as people start to think about that, they're going to say, well, wait a minute, that doesn't limit my employment opportunities to this geographic area. I can work anywhere I want. And the need then, you know, as people, uh, individuals, take more of the power in the employer-employee equation what you've just described here becomes more and more important. They'll evaluate culture, purpose, sense of belonging, camaraderie, th these things in ways that have, I mean, it's always been sort of important, but it was put over like in the other category. Right. Uh, it seems like now it's going to soar, you know, right up into the top and, and two it, or three. And it, and it speaks to exactly what we were talking about, that why purpose has to not be this bolt on. It has to be yeah. something that's part of the strategic approach to how you're organizing yourself. Otherwise, all that stuff gets lost. You're not going to be able to sustain it. 
Well, Charlie, hold up one second here. We're going to uh, take a word from our sponsor, BMC. In a world that's changing faster than ever before, the biggest challenge for businesses is creating fabulous customer experiences. That objective requires actionable insights and real-time agility from one end of your business to the other. At BMC, they call this the autonomous digital enterprise, and they've put together a set of solutions to help you anticipate what's coming, adjust accordingly, and acknowledge those changes from end to end. To start your journey to the autonomous digital enterprise, visit bmc.com slash ADE. Um, Charlie, you know, along these lines, a uh, couple things. First, I wanted to ask you, you had mentioned this idea. Uh, it seems quite compelling, just the, the words. I'd love to hear you uh, dig into a little bit about empathic design. So it's, it's interesting. I was actually writing a report um, not too long ago for a client, and it was all about how to create. It's interesting you brought up BMC here, right? And, and their focus on the experience. It was, it was all about how to create these sort of experiences um, and the challenge with doing so now, particularly because so much of it is falling on IT organizations. And so if, I, if we go all the way back to where we started, the strategic planning, this need to be very agile, driving down to this need to have a heavy focus on purpose and how you connect with both your employees and your customers. Well, a huge part of how that actually manifests itself is in the experience we create for both our employees and our customers. And of course, the vast majority of that experience is in fact digitally enabled or digitally, digitally realized in some way. And so now you come all the way down and who's actually designing those experiences? Well, it's not generally people with experience design you know, training, <laughs> it's IT people. And this can be quite a challenge where there's this disconnect um, because it's not just about creating a pretty interface, it's about this much deeper you know, engagement of how organizations, of how people are interacting with these systems and, and how they're interacting with them in the context of everything else they're doing. And, and where the, the purpose of this article was that that's hard to do. And so how do you overcome that gap? And I remember I was years ago sitting with um, a general manager of a hotel. I used to travel to DC all the time for a project. And so I got to know him. And one day over a few glasses of wine, he um, was lamenting he kind of knew I was in IT and he lamented, said, Charlie, if, if my IT team would just come and spend one day with me in the hotel, they would know how all the stuff they do impacts my ability to serve their customers. That is basically what empathic design is. Empathic design says you may not have empathy. You may not be able to feel the emotions of the people that you're serving. You may not be able to put yourself in their shoes, but there are ways to solve that. And, and this is the challenge I think a lot of technical people have is that we think everyone is as technical as we are. We think that everyone thinks the way we do. I, you know, spend one day on a service desk and you'll know that's so not true, right? And so empathic design basically says to get out of your office, to get into the place where people are using your product, your service, your solution, and experience it with them. Watch it, experience it through their eyes. And this sounds simple, but this isn't about training them. It's not about convincing them that your great design was right. It's about watching what they actually do. And there's a bunch of different techniques and I, um, you can put in your show notes. I know I, I pointed you to an article from the Harvard Business Review from 2009, I think. This is an idea that's been around for a while, but it's, it's very powerful. And, and what was interesting when I was preparing for this talk was just realizing how all these different threads that had been bubbling over the last month sort of all came together. And so um, I, this article uh, will be released here in the next couple of weeks, but um, I think it was just interesting how all of this ends up linking up and, and how this is like this kind of critical set of skills that I think can really help IT organizations cross this chasm as they try to go down this road. So Charlie, this is the first, first time I've heard the specific term of empathic design. So I wanna ask you to talk about it a little more, but could you do that particularly in the context, something that I think really sort of a concept that bubbled up into the public consciousness over the last four or five years of design thinking? What are the, you know, comparisons or contrast design thinking and empathic design? So, so think of design thinking as the macro level. So all, you know, design thinking is the big picture that, that certainly you and I and many of us have been promoting in organizations, right? And so it is, it is based on this idea of designing the entire experience from the perspective of the customer. And um, a subset of that is called um, sometimes user-centered design or human-centric design. And it's this idea of focusing on the human experience as part of that. The challenge with 
both of those sort of bigger picture approaches is that they require that we can have empathy, that we can put ourselves in the shoes of the customer doing it. So if I'm designing for people that are just like me, then this idea of design thinking and human-centered design simply means to think it through, not from the perspective of the code I'm writing or the design I'm putting together, but rather the experience of consuming it. But what happens if you can't? And that's where a lot of this falls apart. And so the research that uh, this came out of Harvard um, on empathic, empathic design was just a series of approaches to help people overcome that empathy gap. And, and the simplest way is simply going out there and, you know, and, and it's sort of like, if you remember uh, from marketing research, it was like focus groups or, you know, observational research. That's it, basically what it is with the big difference being purely, oh, well, two things. The one purely observational, meaning virtually no interaction. You're just observing what's going on. There's a data capture approach where it's really about taking pictures and taking videos so that you can do analysis on the back end, but again, purely observational. This isn't about asking a bunch of questions. And the second big difference is that it's objective rather than to answer specific questions about, you know, do you like the button here or there, which we can do in a lot of different ways. It's about uncovering the unstated need. So, you know, Steve Jobs is famous for saying, and I won't recount the whole story, but when the iPad came out and everyone thought that it, you know, was surprised that it was a great success and this reporter asked him, how did you know? And his famous response was, it's, you know, I didn't do any research. It's not the customer's job to know what they want, right? And so that sort of insight is all based on empathic design. It's this being able to uncover a need that if you simply ask the consumer of that product or service, they couldn't tell you they even needed it because they're not even aware of it. And, and so empathic design is a set of tools to help you uncover those. Yeah, Charlie, when you just said a second ago, you know, if you ask the question, so I, I quick anecdote here to share with you. Um, somebody uh, at, a, at a company where I used to work <clears throat> was gonna start some video project, uh, right? You know, video storytelling. And he was doing a series of focus groups and he, I saw him one day and he said, I just can't really get a fix on, you know, is there something to this or not? He said, would you come to this focus group in New York tonight? I said, sure. I listened to the first five or 10 minutes. I sent in a question. They handed it to him and he looked up at the group and he said, would any of you watch this? And they all said, no. And uh, he said, why didn't you tell me? And they said, because you didn't ask. And so it's, you know, it's, but you know, blindingly obvious after it happens, but right. unless it happens or until it happens, we don't get that because we've been trained to think I'm the expert. I know how to do this. I've spent a lot of time working. I've set up six iterations of it. They've all been knocked down. So this one has to be perfect, right? Well, no, it doesn't. And then you loop that back to your point about continuous disruption. It happens at the engagement level, at the technology level, at the market level, at the, what customers want and need. It's had changing so fast. And, you know, Steve Jobs' iPad, which was quite extraordinary today, it's it's not a blah product itself, but the notion of a tablet, something you could do, it's, it, it, it's ordinary, it's, it's air in some ways. So things are going so fast today. Yeah, no, absolutely. And so that is the whole thing. When you put all these pieces together, what it really comes down to is this ability as, a, as an organization, as a leader, to be agile, and I know that that term is being so abused, but it is the right term. It is being flexible and adaptable because the world is changing quickly. And as you go through that process, you need to establish and, and create a set of tools that help you do that, right? Because I think what happens in most enterprises, it's the rigidity of all this structure, which was vital in the industrial age, is becoming this albatross around our necks. And so how do you pivot? How do you go through that? Well, I think it's a combination of using these strategic planning tools, employing things like, and not just, but like empathic design, broader design thinking principles, infusing them into the culture so that people are constantly exploring new ideas. It's also the driver of innovation. And then rooting everything in this idea of purpose as this engine that sort of propels you forward and gives you that, that um, North Star that you're always sort of going after. And I think, you know, that's where they all kind of come together, but it is, it's, it's a challenging place right now. Um, I, I wanted to, to push a little bit on that, Charlie, because I think you're, you're hundred percent right talking about the need for leaders to be agile and so forth. But um, we've probably all at some point or another gotten ourselves into the traps and said, Oh, I'm so agile. I'm going to look at every possible uh, option here 
every possible outcome. And then I'm going to do it again. And then I'm going to do it again. But they've, so how do you, you know, leaders today have to be able to package that agility and that broad view and that flexibility with it, also a strong sense of decisiveness, um, right? Because you know, at some point we got to go. It, it, it is, I think, you know, we certainly can't afford the analysis paralysis, you know, quagmire, but I think we have a lot of, a lot of uh, tools now, again, that all sort of fit into this whole thing. So part of the OKR, OKR process is about being able to rapidly assess. Um, there's certainly the ideas of fail fast and the, you know, um, I forgot the book now, but the whole startup, right, the, of, of rapidly getting through iteration. So it's, it, it is about being decisive. But it's, I mean, it really, if you think about what, you know, DevOps is even all about, it's about this idea of not having this massive investment, right? There's this, this interesting psychological quirk that we all have that the longer we spend doing something, the more time we spend doing something, the more invested we become in it, and therefore the less likely we are to change it. And so part of the trick from the strategic planning process is to yeah. keep those micro decisions, i.e. my emotional investment in any one decision small, so that I'm not afraid to change it. It doesn't become this, you know, emotional or political thing that, oh, I've been saying this forever, 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 and now suddenly I'm changing my mind, oh, I look like an idiot, right? You, you start getting rid of all of that because it's a series of micro decisions, which gives you the ability to pivot. And so I think it's just about all of these. And, and by the way, purpose, one of the things that this article didn't talk about, but that I think is underrated is that purpose, ironically, should be fairly um, um, indelible, meaning it shouldn't be something that changes a lot but it's also this thing that's way up and out there and it gives you freedom to pivot and change because all you ever have to say is, I realize we have been veering away from our purpose and therefore we must veer back. And so it's a very powerful tool to allow you to pivot ironically because it's, it's a fixed point in space and time, but it's far enough out that it gives you the ability to pivot and move her towards it. So I, I think there, there's a lot of really interesting stuff here at play for leaders to work with. There is, and Charlie, as you were describing that, that sense of purpose, it has to be out there. And it's a little bit like uh, that great old uh, black and white movie, Dr. Strangelove, when, you know, the, the Americans say to the Russians, you know, well, what's the, what the hell's the point of having a doomsday machine if you don't tell people you have a doomsday machine, right? So the purpose thing has to be hammered home, not in a, you know, top down, you'll take this and you'll like a thing, but it's got to be pervasive inside the organization and not thought to be something that, well, they'll, they'll just get it. We'll put it in the annual report and, and I'll touch up on it. And I wanted to push a couple ideas past you. Um, these whole things that you've talked about, you know, some terrific ideas from the OKR, the continuous disruption, empathic design, how you do strategic planning in a in an environment where everything's changing. And you say there's some great tools some books, and you know, I, I believe that, but ultimately more and more, I think the job of the CEO, this sort of new era of leadership that CEOs in particular in today, but any leaders in organizations, because I think it, whether we do this actively or passively, uh, we are making choices in everything we do or choose not to do today. And with, what I'm calling this relevancy cycle is so short, you know, how do you stay on top of that? So whether you, you decline to get involved in something, there's a choice. Whether you choose to say eh, it's risky, you're going to be mediocre then. There's a choice. Uh, this thing of helplessness, well, there's COVID, there's this, there's that, you know, it's somebody's fault. I don't think it's my fault or I wish it wasn't my fault. But I think the other side of it and inside and outside the tech industry, there have been some phenomenal examples over the last three months of companies, sort of this defiant, clear, optimistic, customer-centric approaches that some companies have taken, and they've been wildly successful. So it is possible, I think, but I think that the leaders today, that they make a choice, make it clear, explain it in unmistakably um, open terms to the organization like that, be open to some feedback, but not overly open because the purpose has to come from somewhere and it's got to be set and molded in a way that everybody can get behind. So sorry to go, uh, go on like that, but you have really touched on something that I think is going to be one of the defining things of the next five years. Yeah. And, and I want, you know, I think just the one to add to that. I, so I agree with that. And, and I would, I would argue that it requires a, a almost a new level of leadership courage. I mean, you brought up Benny off earlier and I think he's a great example of this. I, I think it's, it's, you know, yes, it's about being sometimes open to suggestions or to feedback, but more importantly, it's being open, wildly open to criticism, being willing to take that stand 
and saying, this is who we are. This is what we believe and putting yourself out there. And, and I haven't agreed with, you know, everything he has said or done or, you know, the, you know, the, the political aspects that he sometimes pulls in. But, but what you can't deny, and I think to your point, we are seeing this universally, this, this is really what the entire purpose of that Fast Company article was about, is that those organizations that have that embedded and they're willing to put a stake in the ground around it, they're living and dying by it, right? And yeah. you know, if you end up on the wrong side of it, then you know, okay, but the reality is that certainly the, you know, our generations of buyers right now are showing that they will penalize you for not taking a stand. So you need to be prepared to take a stand and let the chips fall where they may. And, and so it, it's, I think it is. And I think for a lot of people that kind of grew up like, you know, like probably me and you in the traditional corporate enterprise, that's like the opposite of what we are taught. And yeah. I remember learning the headline, te- all this stuff, throw it all out the window because our customers, our employees are expecting us to have a point of view, to have a purpose, to be mission driven and to be willing to go out there and make a stand for it. So it's, uh, it's a whole new world. It is. Um, Larry Ellison was always fond of saying, you know, if people aren't calling you crazy on a regular basis, you're not pushing hard enough. <laughs> right. you know, you're, you're to be into saying, Charlie, any sort of final thought or concluding perspective on these big issues you've raised today? Uh, no, other than the fact that, that, you know, I'm, eternally amazed. I mean, the empathic design for what it's worth was new to me as well until I wrote this article. I, I am, I spent, I'm, I have the luxury, unlike a lot of people who work in enterprises, you know, have real jobs. I have the luxury of spending a huge amount of my time doing research, reading about all the stuff, and I'm continuously uncovering new things that I didn't know about, you know, the day before. And so, you know, my one big message is, you know, take heart in that and, and just, go out there and be in constant state of exploration because the answers or at least the clues are out there. We just have to keep searching for them. All right. And Chai, before we go, please remind everybody the best place to look at a lot of your work and see what you're up to. All of my work at Charles Araujo, A-R-A-U-J-O.com. And I'm actually going to give a plug to my other organization that I founded with my, my wife. We've been talking all about purpose and a huge part of uh, we have a group called the MAPS Institute. So just as, as it sounds, the mapsinstitute.com. And we're rolling out a whole bunch of things. It's all about personal purpose and pers- And so a lot of these things, because I think everything that we just said applies organizationally, also applies personally. And so the MAPS Institute is all about that side of it. Fantastic. Well, Charlie, thanks for being with you. Always uh, some lively and sort of head expanding discussions with you. Pleasure. Thanks, Bob. And folks, thanks to all of you for being with us here at Cloud Wars Live. We hope things are going well for you here in the late summer or late July, or early summer. I don't want to rush things, but uh, challenging times here. I hope some of the ideas that uh, Charlie has raised here are going to help you figure out, you know, the best ways to move forward here. Thanks for being with us. We look forward to seeing you next time here at Cloud Wars Live.